Hello everybody. Welcome to my YouTube channel, Homeopathy Super Sessions by Dr. Jagos. Today I'll be doing a small little chapter from J.H. Allen's book, that is Secondary Disease or the Sequelae. The latent chronic miasms which have been there in the inactive state, that is slumbering, have been activated by some acute miasm, such as typhoid fever, scarlet fever, etc. The sequelae of the secondary processes are attributed to the acute myasms. So it means that the chronic myasms are present, but it is in the latent state or in the inactive state or in the slumbering state, slumbering meaning sleeping state, but they have been activated because of some acute myasm such as typhoid fever, scarlet fever, etc. And whatever sequelae or the product of the or the or the continuation of the disease process or the sequelae or the secondary processes are attributed to the acute myasms. So their sequelae is basically attributed to the acute myasms. This is what Dr. J. H. Allen has to say. But he says that this is not so, or this is a false statement. Why? As the secondary or the tertiary processes of the chronic myasm have been overlooked in the treatment of the acute myasin. So they're saying that the treatment of the secondary processes or the tertiary processes of the chronic myasin of sora, syphilis, and psychosis have been overlooked in the treatment of the acute myasin. Now let us see what he still has to say further about it. The acute myasin, as we know, is self-limiting in its action, and it also disappears in a limited time period. So as you all know, the acute myasin it comes on suddenly, it is self-limiting, and also it disappears in a, limited, in, a, in a limited time frame. Therefore, the appearance of the secondary disease is due to the chronic myasm, which was already present in the organism. So whatever secondary disease is, or the secondary or the tertiary sequelae is there, it is always because of the chronic myasm, which was already present in the organism, and it was in the inactive state, but it got activated because of the presence of the acute myasin. So whatever symptoms are coming on as a sequelae or the secondary or the tertiary processes, they are not because of the acute myasin, but they are because of the chronic myasins only. Hanneman says that the vital force always tries to keep down the soric or the chronic myasin as it always tries, strives to get an upper hand. So, what will happen? The vital force will try to fight or will try to keep the activity of the soric myasm down or any other myasm for the fact because the myasms later on, they gain an upper hand or they are more stronger than the vital force. So initially what will happen? The vital force will resist the miasmatic force and will try to maintain health. The acute myasm gains prominence as the restrictive power of the, life of the life force gets weakened. So what happens when the miasmatic influence is constantly bombarding the vital force? The vital force initially, which was strong, will try to resist this. But later on, what happens? The vital force or the resistive power of the vital force gets weakened. Once it gets weakened, it is overruled by the miasm and the miasm takes control of the body and the symptoms are exhibited. Thus, the homeopathic remedy can no longer arrest the disease process as it has now assumed a pathological state. So the miasms which are there, it has weakened the vital force, the vital force succumbs to it and the disease sets in and it progresses and a pathological state has been assumed or a pathological state has been formed. Therefore, we must select a remedy which covers the chronic myasm in order to arrest the disease process. So therefore, if you want to arrest the disease process, your remedy or the similimum which was chosen has to cover the chronic myasms according to the case in hand. By doing so, we have avoided the disease to progress in the pathological state. So if you take into consideration the remedy which covers the miasmatic state of the case, then the pathological state would have been arrested or would not allow to progress further. Now, Dr. H. H. Allen says, let us see an example of scarlet fever. 
In scarlet fever, belladonna was indicated, but it was not given at the proper stage of the disease. So according to symptom similarity, belladonna was indicated, but according, but it wasn't given at the proper stage of the disease or at the proper time. As a result, what happened? An abscess of the middle ear developed. Now, if we have looked into depth of the disease phenomena, we might have seen sulfur, silica, or sorinum, or some other deep acting miasmatic remedy. So Dr. J. H. Allen says that if we had seen or if we had perceived the case in depth or the disease in depth, then we could have had in our mind certain deep, deep acting remedies like sulfur, silica, or sorinum, or any other deep acting miasmatic remedy. If it was done, then we could have mitigated the secondary or the tertiary process of the disease and at the same time mitigated the acute disease also. So if the remedy was chosen according to the miasmatic activity of the case, you could not only have destroyed the secondary or the tertiary process, but also the acute disease. So in one go, if the similimum is there, which covers the miasmatic background of the case, you could eradicate the acute disease as well as the secondary or the tertiary process of the chronic disease. Thus, if this method of prescribing was used, then scarlet fever would have become less dangerous and the fever would have disappeared on the eighth day itself. So along with this, Dr. G. H. Allen says that he gives importance like Dr. Henneman has given importance to the diet and regimen. So along with this, the diet and regimen of the patient has to be looked into or it has to be modified. In diet, no solid food is to be taken if you're suffering from scarlet fever. And in regimen, avoidance of cold air and exposure to cold wind should be avoided. And he further says, the longer the acute miasm exists in the organism, there is a great danger to life due to the rapid destructive processes. So naturally, if the my acute miasm is there in the organism and it is there for a longer time, because of its acute, rapid, destructive nature, it will destroy or the pathology will increase. They combine the action with the chronic miasm of Sora or any other miasm that may be present. So why does the pathology increase? Because the action is combined with the action of the chronic miasm of Sora or any other miasm which may be present. Hanneman says that the acute miasm cannot exist without the presence of the chronic miasm of either Sora, syphilis or psychosis. So Hanneman says that Acute miasm cannot exist. That means what? The chronic miasm has to be present, then only the acute miasm will exist. If chronic miasm is not there, acute miasm will also not exist in the individual. Thus, the acute miasms cannot bond themselves with the life force until the chronic miasms are present. There must be a basic miasm like the sin process, which already exists in the organism. So, therefore, he again, uh, Dr. J.H. again, Allen again reminds you of the sin process, which Dr. Kent has said that the Sora is the first, is the first wrong thinking, wrong feeling, and wrong action and wrong behavior of the person. So it originates in the mind and then it is reflected on the body. So therefore, he says the basic miasm that is Sora, because of the sin process, it already exists in the organism. The life force has failed to save the organism from the disease condition, and it makes the way for the acute miasm to enter the body. So what happens when the sin process takes place, the vital force gets weakened and the miasm enters the body. Thus, to arrest the pathological developments, we must search for the basic miasmatic symptoms in each case. So therefore, if you want to arrest the pathological changes, we have to search or we have to identify correctly what is the miasmatic background in each case. Even if we have dispelled the effects of the acute miasm by use of anti-miasmatic agents, the soric or chronic miasmatic process now sets up a stasis or a new central point of elimination of its own pathological debris. Now, what does that mean? It says that even if we have taken out all the acute miasms by the use of anti-miasmatic age agents. Huh? The other chronic miasmatic process like Sora or syphilis or psychosis, it goes into a period of stagnation or a new central point of elimination of its own pathological debris is produced. That means what? 
or either the chronic miasm it it goes into an it, into a neutral state or an stasis or an or, or an stage which is inactive or it becomes a new central point or some other point of elimination is there as a result of which the pathology can be expelled so that it could be in a form of a discharge it could be in a form of uh, of any other pathological fluid coming out of the body this could have been avoided if we had taken into consideration the chronic miasmatic process which was in hand with the acute disease so again in this chapter he goes on reminding you that we have to take into consideration the chronic miasmatic process which was in hand to hand with the acute disease by doing so the whole disease process would have become shortened and the suffering of the patient would also reduce so if we are taken into consideration of it taken into consideration the chronic miasmatic process in the case we could have shortened the suffering of the patient as well as the whole disease process this point is the strongest distinguishing point between true homeopathy and a false one so this is the most important point whereby you can distinguish a true homeopathic practitioner or or a person practicing true homeopathy and a person claims to practice true homeopathy but he is practicing false homeopathy so that so which point is that it is the identification of the chronic miasmatic process and not of the acute miasmatic process so every time and again dr j h allen reminds you that you have to take into consideration the depth in the case you have to perceive the chronic miasmatic process in the case so if you could identify the chronic miasmatic process you are a true homeopathic doctor or this is true homeopathy if not you are practicing the false one thus we all thus we can call homeopathy a true science so if we practice homeopathy by identifying the chronic miasm then we can call it a true science or true homeopathy all the systems of medicine can be known as a pseudo science or an imperfect cure and all of the systems of medicine are known as the false science or the pseudo science or an imperfect science of cure thus it it is the difference between palliation and cure and between true knowledge and imperfect knowledge so therefore dr j h allen says that you must know the difference between palliation and cure that means what when can you palliate and when can you cure cure a case so palliation as you all know occurs in incurable cases and cure will occur in cases in curable cases or whether or where there's only functional disturbances and the pathology is reversible and definite and de and de that is why you can come to know or you can distinguish between true knowledge and the imperfect knowledge thus to sum it up we must have a sound knowledge about the nature of the miasm and the action upon the vital force so you have to have a strong foundation of the nature of the miasm and what is its action on the vital force thus we must be able to follow the processes in a proper manner just like linking together links of a unbroken chain so just like a chain is linked by each link and it becomes a long single chain which is un uninterrupted or it is not broken so in a similar process we must know the action of the miasms on the vital force which occurs in a systematic manner thus the knowledge cannot be confined to the present state but also extends to the prophetic life so he further says that a physician cannot only uh, confine the knowledge to his to his to his present state but also it extends to the prophetic level so a prescriber can be uh, can be a uh, artistic a prescriber can be prophetic so he has said about the prophetic prescriber thus we can prognosticate the case before and so if you have a if you are on the prophetic level dr j h allen says that you will be able to prognosticate the hand the case beforehand in its mysterious movements so whatever however the case is moving in which direction or in which mysterious movements the case is that is 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 uh, is flowing you will be able to prognosticate the case beforehand and then what then what will happen we can tackle the new developments which come on unexpectedly so whatever new developments of the case is there 
which comes on unexpectedly, we can also tackle that. So this at a higher level, he goes saying that the physician should not only be knowledgeable, he should not be artistic, but also he should be prophetic in prescribing. So this is another method of prescribing, but this has to have, I mean, you have to be very experienced and you have, will, you'll, you'll only get this prophetic level maybe after 30 to 40 years of experience. So this is what he wants to tell you in this small chapter of secondary disease or the sequel. So I hope you like the short video. If you're new to the channel, please do subscribe. If you like my presentation, please do give it a thumbs up. And till date, I have done totally 127 videos, which includes this video also. Thank you very much.